The mysteries of the night sky have always been an inspiration to storytellers. The moon, stars and far galaxies are a constant challenge to our imagination. Fueled by fear of the unknown and our irrepressible urge to explore it, space travel is the ultimate science fiction adventure. Space exploration is the greatest adventure story of our time, and science fiction paved the way, opening up this new horizon to a popular audience. The drive to see what lies beyond the known world has inspired generations of explorers. For centuries, they set out for the remotest regions of the planet, returning with fantastic stories of discovery. Such tales were the inspiration for Jules Verne, one of the great storytellers of early science fiction. What set his stories apart from other travellers' tales was his imaginative use of contemporary technology. The internal combustion engine, the telephone and light bulb first appeared in the 1870s. Verne's submarine was based on an 1801 American prototype designed by Robert Fulton. It even had the same name, the Nautilus. His spaceship, travelling to the moon, was, however, pure imagination. Verne's importance is recognised by sci-fi writer and space visionary Arthur C. Clarke. I think Jules Verne was one of the most influential writers who's ever lived. Of course, we think of him primarily as a science fiction writer describing wonderful inventions. But his real interest, I think, was exploration and discovery and adventure. Verne's genius was to make the fantastic seem plausible. In his 1865 story, From Earth to the Moon, the heroes take the science of ballistics to its limits and beyond. Their spacecraft is a bullet-shaped projectile fired into space by a cannon buried deep underground. In reality, the impact of the blast would have killed the crew, but Verne's readers were prepared to suspend their disbelief. They were confident about the future of technological achievement. Amazingly, Verne got some details of the flight spot on. After their trip to the moon, his heroes splashed down in the Pacific, exactly like the Apollo astronauts who first circled the moon in 1968. In 1902, the first sci-fi film hit the screen. The master of early cinema, George Méliès, made a spectacle out of the journey to the moon. His projectile was similar to Verne's and also strangely predictive of the modern supergun. It certainly gave the man in the moon something to think about. Modern sci-fi filmmakers still get inspiration from Méliès' pioneering experiments in special effects. The forerunners of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin seem at home on the moon. And for the first time, the cinema audience was shown one of the most striking images of the 20th century, the view of Earth as a planet seen from space. Méliès had been inspired by First Men in the Moon, written the year before by H.G. Wells. Wells had found an alternative solution to the tricky business of spaceflight. 
Cavorite was a magical paste which made anything or anyone immune to the usual forces of gravity. A trip to the moon in a spherical spaceship coated with Cavorite is the starting point for an unlikely adventure. This is how it began. This is a solemn moment in the history of mankind. Cavorite was a dramatic device that enabled Wells to get his characters to the moon. But it was more than just an anti-gravity artifice. It was symptomatic of a whole new public mood of scientific optimism. But over 60 years ago, writer H.G. Wells anticipated the shape of things to come with his fascinating adventure, First Men. The age of the motor car and aeroplane was dawning. Rutherford and Einstein were making progress in atomic physics. And spaceflight was moving from fantasy to just being fantastically difficult. The distinction is important for nuclear physicist Professor Lawrence Krauss. You have to be extremely careful when you're either a scientist or, or someone writing about science fiction to distinguish between what's impossible and what's merely impractical or almost impossible. It's a very important distinction because what's impractical today will one day happen. There's no telling how far this revolutionary rocket ship may travel, perhaps into outer space, perhaps to the very moon. The father of rocket technology was a Russian visionary and scientist, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. At the turn of the century, when Meliès was sending men to the moon, Tsiolkovsky was already designing the prototype rockets and making the complex calculations which were to turn the fantasy of spaceflight into reality. Rockets, not cannon, were to be the technology of the space age. Tsiolkovsky was a storyteller as well as a scientist. His scientific discoveries laid the ground for both the Russian and the American space programs, and his stories about space travel began the close relationship between the early rocket scientists and science fiction. Space travel might have happened eventually, even if science fiction didn't exist, though I rather doubt it. But almost all the engineers and scientists who worked in space, uh, on spacecraft were turned on by science fiction, and some of them, quite a few of them, wrote it as well. The German scientist Hermann Oberth was one of the great pioneers of spaceflight. He developed Tsiolkovsky's theories on rocket technology in the 1920s, and his ideas were used in the screenplay for Fritz Lang's sci fi film The Woman in the Moon. With Oberth's close involvement, the film became an extraordinary prediction of things to come. Oberth worked on the set, helping to design the rocket ship, making sure it was as close as possible to the real thing. So, 40 years before man landed on the moon, the public was seeing an astonishingly accurate preview of how spaceflight would one day look. The film was the first to be based on contemporary scientific knowledge. But it wasn't just the technology which made Woman in the Moon believable. The film introduced the tension of the pre-flight countdown, a feature of every real space launch ever since. It even experimented with the strange new concept of weightlessness. Above all, it showed the wonderful possibilities of space travel. But the film was so realistic, it was banned by Hitler. He ordered the Gestapo to destroy both the plans and the model of the spaceship. He had other ideas for the use of rocket technology. Research into space travel was halted as German scientists were forced to turn their designs into weapons of war. Their experiments continued at a feverish pace. At first, there were spectacular failures. But by 1944, 
V2 rockets were hurtling hundreds of miles into the heart of London. After the war, Hermann Oberth and the German rocket team were taken to America, where they propel the rocket program in weapons and in space research. As rocketry evolved, the public was gradually introduced by science fiction stories and films to the final goal, Destination Moon. In 1950, the movie industry again called on the services of Hermann Oberth as a technical consultant. The film Destination Moon was based on a story by Robert Heinlein, the leading American science fiction writer of the 1940s and 50s. I thought I'd seen everything. Just look at those cities. Is that Los Angeles? Or San Francisco. Sure. That's Los Angeles. That's New York. Can you see Brooklyn? Sure, there's Brooklyn. I wonder who's pitching. A view of Earth from space was still a magical experience. At the turn of the century, it had been a dream of early cinema. The 50s destination moon showed that the dream was close to reality. Forrest Ackerman, a leading American expert on science fiction, remembers the impact of the film. Destination Moon really opened the eyes of the public to the potential of space because it was done seriously. For one mad moment, uh, they wanted to have dancing girls on the moon, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Heinlein uh, nixed that. And uh, they had the, the wonderful uh, artist uh, Chesley Bonestell, who, who made the moon so realistic with uh, his backgrounds that uh, I think for the first time uh, people were beginning to take uh, it, it, it seriously uh, and uh, 1949, just 20 years later, we were on the moon. Contact light, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. July 21st, 1969. Science fiction and science fact finally came together. The fantastic voyage had reached its first destination. The journey out from Earth wasn't just a triumph of technology. It turned space into the high frontier. In the Cold War era of the 1950s, sci-fi films predicted that once we had the technology to travel through space, we would want to colonize the new territories that we found. By the grace of God, and the name of the United States of America, I take possession of this planet on behalf of and for the benefit of all mankind. The space race between Russia and America, each fighting to dominate this new unexplored realm, became a potent Cold War symbol. When the Russians pushed a man across the threshold, he was Yuri Gagarin, the astronaut the Russians lionized as the first to orbit the Earth. It was the propaganda coup of the year. Three men to represent the culmination of a dream and the beginning of a new concept of reality. This competitive drive distorted the dreams of the early sci-fi visionaries, according to astronaut Story Musgrave, a veteran of six space flights. When the technologies came along to go and do space flight, we forgot the human dream. We forgot why we were really doing this. We said, hey, we're going into space flight to compete people across the waters out there. We are going to show them that our political structure, the way we harness technology, is superior to them. Wherever there is a frontier, there is an opportunity for conflict. The first sci-fi magazines, Amazing Stories and Fantastic Adventures, were to turn space into the ideal setting for epic battles between good and evil. With the 1930s pulp magazines, science fiction emerged as pure entertainment. 
they were a much needed escape from the grim reality of the depression years in America. Space was as wild and fascinating a frontier as the old Wild West. Instead of Mustangs, the cowboys were riding rockets and the Indians were likely to have eight legs and as many eyes. These magazines were launching pads for heroes, larger than life characters ready to risk everything to save humanity from some deadly threat in outer space. Flash, get me out of here, get me out. Dale, Dale, listen to me. Don't be afraid. We'll get you out somehow. Before transferring to the screen, Flash Gordon began life as a comic strip character. Every week, aided by the brilliant scientist Hans Zarkov, he fought the good fight with the Emperor of the Universe, Ming the Merciless of the planet Mongo. Well, they had a couple of heroes in the early days. There's Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon. They were almost twin brothers in the fact of their stalwartness and, and uh, their ability to uh, overcome any kind of a disaster. Of course, every seven days, uh, we thought it was the end of them, was what we call a, a cliffhanger, and, and they were in some dreadful position. We had to hold our breath uh, till the next week to see how they escaped. But, but uh, they were uh, the kind of men that a kid would like to, to grow up and emulate. Children of all ages love heroes. Never before. Buck's mission was to save America from the Red Mongols and his arch enemy, Killer Kane. As the original Star Warrior, Buck Rogers. Hey, buddy, you take the controls and keep her as she is. We're headed for the planet Saturn. Yes, sir. You followed his exploits in the comics. You thrill to them on the radio. This was the world of space opera, light years away from real science. A combination of glamour and escapism, mythic battles for survival played out across the galaxies. In the 1940s, one of the most popular writers of the genre was Doc Smith, creator of the Skylark and Lensman series, in which space was a place where fantasies came true. The joy of Doc Smith's world was that anything was possible according to a scientist who collaborates with many of today's sci-fi writers, Jack Cohen. I read Lensman in the 1950s, and they were great. You just had to throw away any belief in any kind of science at all, and you could pick up a tin opener and a bit of wire and an old radio bulb and something else and make a sublight transmitter. It just took you a day, you know. You needed a, some, a couple of other things and a bit of thorium and so, something else that sounded equally mysterious to the reader. And you could do absolutely anything. Dad, it's me. I'm on board the ship. What now? Try to slow it down, son. The controls are basically huh? the same as your psych rotor. The fascination of heroic tales in outer space has continued for another generation of young enthusiasts. Is it responding? I think so. I'll try to bring her in for a soft landing. Space opera has moved from the pulp mags to provide the epic storylines of movie blockbusters. Uh, what are you doing? You're not actually going into an asteroid field. They'd be crazy to follow us, wouldn't they? to do this to impress me. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. The Star Wars series is, I think, particularly interesting as science fiction films because it's set very firmly in 1930s tradition of science fiction stories. It's definitely E. Smith and Lensman and this kind of thing, and it makes them real for all those of us who are brought up on that kind of thing. Gosh, it's exciting, it's cosmic, and here we have the great Darth Vader, who's the, you know, you, everyone can hate Darth Vader. Great. The conflict between good and evil is understood by everyone. There is a great disturbance in the form. I have felt it. We have a new enemy, Luke Skywalker. Yes, my master. He could destroy us. Star Wars' origins clearly lie in ancient folklore. To become a man, the hero has to wrestle with his conscience, 
while being empowered by a quasi-religious force against the evils of materialism and power. There's even a princess who gets herself into all kinds of fixes, and a hero who has to fight to win her back. It's a sci-fi fairy tale set on the high frontier of space, but the storytelling demands for drama take the action a long way from the realities of space travel. In Star Wars, the intergalactic battles were based on Second World War dogfights, ignoring the fact that streamlining the starfighters is an unnecessary luxury in the vacuum of outer space. Dazzling but impractical spacecraft design has even resulted in some unexpected innovations. In the classic space opera, Star Trek, necessity was the mother of invention. The Enterprise is a beautiful looking craft, but it doesn't land very well. And in fact, uh, it, it led uh, Gene Roddenberry originally in the original series to say, well, how are we going to get people down to the planet and uh, to, to have the action happen? And uh, he said, well, let's just beam them down there. The spacecraft won't land. We'll, we'll just make a transporter. In fact, it was really governed by practicality. They didn't have the money to show a beautiful spacecraft landing each week. Star Trek has also proved adept at using technobabble to create an air of scientific plausibility. We traced the shuttle's energy signature to this point on the surface, but there's too much interference to scan the location. I'm intentionally jamming our sensors. It looks more like a natural phenomenon. There's an unusually high amount of EM interference in the planet's magnetosphere. Can we transport through the interference? We could, but there could be 50 Borg down there waiting for us and we'd never even know it. I think we have to take the risk. Agreed. Take a well-armed away team and transport down to those coordinates. Have the transporter chief keep a permanent lock on your signals so we can get you out of there at the first sign of trouble. Yes, sir. Mr. Worf, you're with me. They also use deflector shields, phase transition coils, matter-antimatter drives, and phasers set to stun. Riker to Enterprise. We're on the surface. Whether traveling in a sleek galaxy hopper or a flying donut, our urge to explore remains as powerful as ever. We will always want to go deeper into outer space. Three, two, one. Designing the spaceships that could travel the vast distances beyond the moon has been a continuing challenge to the ingenuity of science fiction writers and filmmakers. The journey out through our solar system is in itself a breathtaking adventure. Reflecting our universal fascination with neighboring planets since ancient times, they're even named after classical gods a blending of mysticism and mathematics familiar to modern science fiction. And further out, the awe-inspiring prospect of 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone, and an infinite number in the universe beyond. In 1968, a year before the first man walked on the moon, the monumental spectacle of long-distance space travel was presented at its most dramatic. Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, based on a story by Arthur C. Clarke, set the standard for realism and grandeur in outer space. 2001 was an epic adventure story ending with the journey to Jupiter in a stunningly realistic spacecraft. The film renewed the link between the American space program and science fiction. The designer of the 2001 spacecraft, Harry Lang, had worked in the Future Projects team at NASA in the 1950s. Putting their visionary ideas down on paper, Lang had developed an ability to design futuristic spaceships. His opportunity to work on 2001 came from a chance meeting with the writer Arthur C. Clarke. So he wanted to see some of the artwork that I had with me. And he did, and he said, well, I'm working with Stanley Kubrick at the moment on the filming or the possible filming of one of my short stories, Journey Beyond the Stars. 
Uh, would you be interested in working on it? I mean, you seem to have the background of future space travel for real, I mean, for proje projections. And um, I called Stanley Kubrick, maybe he would like to see what you have. So I got a call 10 o'clock at night next morning up at the penthouse at Stanley Kubrick. He said, well, I can get better illustrators than you are for a dime a dozen in New York, but I don't have that background. <laughs> in 2001, Lang's spaceships were truly convincing. Floating in the vast expanse of space, they gave the public some impression of the scale of the journey we would need to make to venture out past neighboring planets in our solar system. Since 2001, the public has come to expect spaceships that will dominate the screen, extraordinary craft that move through space like gigantic battle cruisers. One of the leading designers in the field, Sid Mead, is aware that he always has to go one step beyond the audience's expectations. In order to build in a sense of awe, you, you, you do have to use cliché. You have to use images that people associate with awe-inspiring things. And I can use a specific example. When I was working on, on Star Trek with uh, Robert Wise, the director, we, we designed the in interior of the V'ger entity. What I did was take the, the apse of a classic cathedral and turn it 90 degrees so that you are now looking this way horizontally instead of up. And then I just rotated it. So we had sort of this prismatic, uh, almost a kale kaleidoscopic array of pattern, and the, the effect was, was really quite astounding. It's one thing to design grand and impressive spaceships, but science fiction also has to come to terms with the human implications of traveling into outer space, a trip that could take many years. Brian Aldous, science fiction author and guru, reveals one of the solutions available. There are various ways in which you can travel a long distance. Let's say to the nearest star or round the galaxy. And an early primitive idea was the multi-generation starship, where generations would live and die as the ship made its slow progress towards Alpha Centauri or whatever. But a voyage that might last hundreds of years is not the most attractive proposition. The nearest star is 4.3 light years away from Earth. So science fiction has had to come up with a better idea for crossing the vast distances involved in intergalactic travel. One answer has been faster than light travel, which has become a wonderfully simple, sometimes comical contrivance in the sci-fi box of tricks. Eight, seven, six. It's always a startling five, way to beat the four, light barrier. Three, two, one, drop. Hyperdrive sequence begun. Hit it, pin back. Race for force field. <laughs> The fuel requirements for faster-than-light travel would be immense. To accelerate a single atom to near the speed of light would use more fuel than is produced in a year on Earth. One sci-fi flight of fantasy is to build a spaceship in an asteroid and use the local raw materials to fuel the trip. Whatever the practical difficulty, the theory of faster-than-light travel is a hot topic among physicists. Here's what may be possible, at least in principle. Go out in a space shuttle up to 200 miles above the Earth, and then turn off your engines. All you have to arrange is for now the space between you and the nearest star to catastrophically collapse in one second, and the sp then the space between you and the Earth to catastrophically expand in one second, and then you look around, and now you're 200 miles from the nearest star, four light years away from the Earth, and then you turn on your regular engines and go the rest of the way in an hour. That's how warp drive would work, in principle, if we could do it.
Whatever device science fiction uses to transport us on our expedition of discovery into deep space, we know that sooner or later we will need to confront one question. Is there any other intelligent life out there? Imagine yourself as one of the crew of this faster-than-light spaceship of the future, sharing their curiosity to know the unknown, their tension, their readiness for inconceivable adventures. Sir, we're being radar scanned. United Planets Cruiser C-57D, J.J. Adams commanding. Who are you? Sixteen years after Leslie Nielsen discovered the Forbidden Planet, Pioneer 10 set out to explore the deepest reaches of our solar system. A year later, it passed Jupiter and travelled on into deep space. Pioneer carried with it NASA's first message in a bottle for the attention of any passing aliens. It was a shot in the dark, based on the assumption that if we exist, then surely there must be life somewhere in the universe. Science fiction has been making the most of that possibility for years. From beyond space, it came, an unspeakable terror, so horrible, no man who saw it lived to tell another. Bone was its food, blood was its drink. All the earth was its prey. The threat of an alien stowaway takes the drama of space flight up a notch or two, playing on our fear of the unknown. How could that thing have gotten aboard? And why? Just to kill us? There's the usual reason an intelligent creature kills. It's hungry. Science fiction has projected our hopes and fears onto every conceivable alien life form. They come in all shapes and sizes. It's a chance for the imagination to run wild. If you find yourself on an unfamiliar planet, anything can happen. Before modern computer-generated special effects, animation based on comic classics was the best way of bringing aliens to life. The ancestry of aliens is at least as old as mankind. We've always dreamed up some strange creature just out of sight, a bear that speaks, who knows what, a goblin, a thing that appears in the night, a ghost, a vampire, a whole range of imaginary, often impossible things. Aliens were the stock in trade of the early science fiction magazines. These bug-eyed monsters, as they became known, took to its limits a fascination with the weird and wonderful in the natural world. These are the fantastic creatures waiting for us if we venture out into the galactic void. But the stranger the alien, the closer it may be to reality. According to modern scientific thinking, aliens which look even remotely like us are only science fiction. Other planets, with their own particular conditions for evolution, would produce very different looking aliens. The idea fascinates Professor of Biology, Jack Cohen. It's very difficult to begin to imagine what you can't imagine. It must be that out there on uh, planets around all the other stars in our galaxy, there are going to be real aliens. And I think there must be immense numbers of biological tricks that aliens are doing out there that we can't imagine. The film Alien took the fear of the unknown into a new dimension. Wait a minute, this movement. It seems to have life, organic life.
like origins of this alien makes it even more terrifying, sci-fi writer Stephen Baxter. The film Alien is a science fiction story, but has many of the elements of a horror story. Uh, running around the corridors in the dark, threat, being trapped by this, uh, this hideous force. But, but what makes it a science fiction story, and to me more horrifying, is the fact that it's based on rational principles. The alien is a kind of nightmare vision of our own biology. It's motherhood, reproduction turned against us. This is something which has its own rationale. It could exist. In, in a sense, it's a prediction of our modern science, the rational side of our, of our souls, come back to confront us and haunt us. All right, where are you? Come on, quit playing around. Not everyone takes aliens too seriously. Get away! Come on. Come on, come on. When I brought you on the ship, I thought you were cute. As well as the cute and the monstrous, outer space has also been the setting for an encounter with aliens far more advanced than us. Arthur C. Clarke's classic story began in 2001 with the discovery on the moon of a strange alien warning system. Here's what started the whole thing. Well. We thought it might be the upper part of some buried structure, so we excavated out on all sides. And what's more, it seems to have been deliberately buried. A shrieking monolith, deliberately buried by an alien intelligence, starts man on a mission half a billion miles into space. Human evolution is being monitored by aliens far superior to us. Uh, Arthur Clarke, I think, believes very reasonably that there are many older races out there. If these creatures are thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years ahead of us, then the kinds of thoughts they have are not the kinds of thoughts we have. They're the kinds of thoughts we attribute to gods. And I think Arthur Clarke's idea that the galaxy is inhabited by older races whose science looks to us like magic must be true. The search for the origin of the monoliths continues in the story 2010, with the discovery of life on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. By the time Clark wrote 3001, many in the sci-fi community felt the gap between science and fiction was narrowing. To Clark himself, pictures sent back by NASA's Galileo space probe in 1997 seemed to support his notion of some form of life on Europa. Running right across one of the pictures is an absolutely straight, narrow line. And if you saw this, you'd say, well, that's obviously a highway or a railroad track. And no one can explain it. It's about 200 kilometers long, and it's dead straight, except for a slight wriggle where there's some change of terrain. And we're all very, very puzzled about this. And in fact, I'm beginning to think the unthinkable. Whatever Clark thinks about the discovery of alien life forms, the question of first contact is a hot sci-fi topic. If aliens turn their attention on planet Earth, would they bring destruction or salvation? The idea that there is something or someone out there has an eternal fascination for us on Earth. For some, the alien is a potential source of divine intervention. For others, the ultimate threat. In 1898, one of the most influential stories in science fiction set the scene for an invasion of Earth. War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells opens with a chilling description of the alien threat. No one would believe in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's. And yet, across the gulf of space, intellects vast and cool and unsympathetic slowly and surely drew their plans against us. Wells turned the Martian invaders with superior technology into the enemy. The 1953 film used modern weaponry, but the fear of the outsider was the same. This could be the beginning of the end for the human race. 
for what men first thought were meteors or the often ridiculed flying saucers are in reality the flaming vanguard of the invasion from Mars. Looks like they're going to come out of that gully pretty soon. We'll have to rush our defenses to be ready when they do. Guys need plenty of reinforcements. We'll get them. Lieutenant! Look! They slash across country like scythes, wiping out everything that's trying to get away from them. That explains why communication is cut the moment their machines begin moving. Montreal's blacked out. Nothing more has come through. Reflecting and even encouraging contemporary paranoia, this American film replaces the marching machines of the book with terrifying flying saucers. Dish-shaped UFOs first appeared in the popular press at the same time. On the red planet. Foreshadowing modern trends in biotechnology and germ warfare, Wells predicted that the alien weakness would be biological rather than mechanical. This invasion from Mars is a thinly veiled reference to the fear of communist invasion. In the 50s, we had the, the Red Menace, and uh, that uh, equated with uh, the red planet Mars uh, menacing us. And uh, there were quite a few films, I think, that uh, were, were based on uh, the inherent fear that we had at that time uh, during the Cold War. When the American public were being warned that the Reds could and would try anything, the association between communists and little green men from Red Planet Mars was an easy one to create. Hollywood science fiction conspired with McCarthyite propaganda to present communism as a deadly threat to freedom and the American way of life. They come from another world, spawned in the light years of space, unleashed to take over the bodies and souls of the people of our planet, bringing a new dimension in terror. Jack! When vegetable pods came from outer space, they robbed human beings of their feelings and emotion. I don't know. Suddenly, while you're asleep, they'll absorb your minds, your memories. I don't want any part of it. You're forgetting something, Miles. What's that? You have no choice. These were the body snatchers, threatening to take over small town America. As the unimaginable becomes real, the impossible becomes true. Stop and listen! Stop and listen to me! Listen! Listen! This is what it's like to have your mind controlled by an evil, evil ideology like communism. This is how it feels. So it's a dramatization of our fears uh, and our hopes about ourselves turned back on ourselves. Science fiction has Famous for the day of the Triffids and the Chrysalids, John Wyndham's sense of unease has been described as cozy catastrophe. Mysterious force. And later at one and the same In the village of the damned, the threat comes from alien insemination the golden-eyed children who result from this unnatural coupling seek to take over. Like the changelings of folklore, they just mysteriously appear, upsetting the established order of, in this case, an apparently conventional English village. Let me get this straight. You imply that these children may be the result of impulses directed towards us from somewhere in the universe. What we need is time to investigate. The biological threat gave Wyndham's vision a particular power. The threat of aliens destroying our comfortable lives has made us less than receptive to the potential benefits of first contact. We haven't been able to make our control reach as far as a high aircraft. Well, now you have, is that it? Flying saucers have invaded our planet. Washington, London, Paris, Moscow are key targets. Science fiction films, by and large, demonstrate severe xenophobia. There's a, a prevalent belief, apparently, that anything green and moving and with a big head deserves to be blasted out of existence and no questions asked afterwards. Um, this doesn't bode very well for when the aliens actually uh, appear and say, Look, chaps, we could run this planet for you in a much better way. You could have a utopia here if you let us take it over. What would our response be? We bring you this special radio television broadcast in order to give you the very latest information on an amazing phenomenon. The arrival of a space ship in Washington. 
The army has taken... The day the Earth stood still was produced at the height of the Cold War and an escalating nuclear arms race. I think something is happening. The human reaction to the alien visitor is predictable. But this time, the alien has come not as an invader, but on a mission to save us from ourselves. The message is clear. Nuclear warfare threatens the security of the entire planet. I came here to give you these facts. But if you threaten to extend your violence, this earth of yours will be reduced to a burned out cinder. Like other outsiders, the alien engenders a sense of uncertainty and even fear. But the face of the unknown could be friendly. Through the unprejudiced eyes of a child, the alien is transformed from enemy to buddy. It is part of that transformation to get the species to grow to a point which it accepts other living forms, accepts in terms of a felt intuitive sense that yes, we are not alone. We have been through a major step in this transformation when we as a species accept the other even without factual proof of the other. That proof of alien existence may take some time to materialize, or it could be here already. It may be that we're never going to meet aliens. The distances between stars are very great. It may be that we've actually all met aliens, but so good is their technology that we don't know that this is the case. Is it possible that in our cities, on the pavements and in the parks, they are already among us? Have aliens from outer space already come down to Earth? Recognizing aliens has always been something of a problem. Men in Black supposes that at any one time, there are about 1,500 aliens on Earth, but as most live in Manhattan, nobody notices. But I still work here because I love the hours. I'm talking about guns, smart ass. Weird ones. Come on, Edward, what you see is what I got. One of them is running a dodgy pawn shop. Why don't you show him the imports, Jeeves? Hi, Kay, how are you? Show him the imports right now. I got out of that business a long time ago. Why do you lie to me, Jeeves? I hate it when you lie. Now just hold on a second. I'm gonna count to three. The man in black recognizes the alien. His apprentice doesn't. But you know what? Talk to me. He, he is just crazy when he's like this. He's always crazy. Why don't you get a massage? Take a cruise. Three. Drop the weapon and put your hands on your head. I warned him. Drop the weapon! You warned him. Don't make me kill you. You're insensitive. Do you have any idea how much that stings? Show us the merchandise, you're gonna lose another head, Jeeves. While the men in black are looking for aliens on the Lower East Side, the rest of the sci-fi community expect the quest for intelligent life on another planet to be advanced by space travel. The dreams of science fiction and the theories of real science may one day coincide. For the moment, they are at least asking some of the same questions. If uh, we were to be visited, clearly, whatever visits us would be advanced beyond us by hundreds of thousands of years. If they have found the secret to whatever way it is they bypass the distances and they have found a secret to interstellar travel, they are advanced, you know, way, way beyond us. The imaginative possibilities of spaceships and aliens were seen at their most dramatic in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Fear of the unknown has been replaced by fascination. The film even suggests that aliens might be as interested in us as we are in them. The question of first contact with intelligent life out there has always inspired sci-fi storytellers. And with recent speculation about life on Mars and the discovery of water on the moon, real scientific inquiry is now closing on science fiction. The 21st century could provide both with some unexpected answers.
combat with the monsters of his own creation, the Sci-Fi Files turns to technology and the relentless march of the machines.